Hello, my name is Raya Hamalainen, and I work as a professor in the field of technology enhanced learning at the University of Jyväskylä, Finland. Our research focuses on technology enhanced learning in various settings. We aim to understand how learning and interaction, as well as professional development processes, develop and unfold over time. The driving force for our research is that the world is actually changing rapidly. This structural change involves whole education and society. Therefore, the aim of education is not only to develop specific skills and competencies, but actually to support and teach learning processes. For example, creative problem solving. The challenge is also how to find innovative multi multidisciplinary methods and technologies for enhancing learning and professional development. In close collaboration with my colleague, Professor Bram de Weaver, we have been focusing on the large-scale assessment studies and trying to find and understand how the technologies are actually influencing on the people's skills and competencies. In the first part of my talk, I will focus on our results based on these large-scale assessment data. Since it might be a bit boring if I only talk, then I will give a voice for our research group and we will introduce the novel methods in authentic workplace settings that we have been developing and working with. And finally, in the end of the talk, we will focus also on the theme of the conference, education and citizenship, through our CS Track project, in which we have been seeking how citizen science actually involves in current society and how it influences on learning. In the current society, there are several challenges. And one of these grounded challenges is problem solving skills in technology rich environments, which seems to be one of the critical competencies to be mastered. This can be illustrated, for example, through the structural change from mass production to the flexible production methods. For example, in Finland only, more than 100,000 jobs has disappeared from the industrial sector. And therefore, the changing needs of the working life create new challenges for the, for example, for the vocational education and training. There are needs for handling and producing new information, as well as solving problems in the technology-rich environments. Then the critical question is, what kind of skills and competencies do people actually have? So far, most of the investigations regarding the problem-solving skills have been empirical case studies, which are very important, of course. On the other hand, we also need large-scale understanding what is the state of art, and therefore we have been using the PIAC data to investigate what kind of uh, skills and competencies adults do have. And in short, PIAC data is a large-scale pro program for monitoring performance in literacy, numeracy and technology-rich problem-solving. And we have been using the technology-rich problem-solving data. And in practice, it includes a large back background questionnaire as well as computer-based tests. And in PIAC, the adult skills are classified in four clusters, strong, moderate and weak, as well as people who are at risk. We have been using that data to actually investigate different kind of groups of adults. And finally, we have been focusing on the formal, non-formal and inflow formal learning of adults and how it's associated with the skills and competencies. And what we have actually been doing in practice is that we have developed models based on the theoretical assumptions as well as empirical support. We have developed so-called SVE model in which we firstly have focused on the sociodemographic socio factors in our first cluster since we already know that very often the sociodemographic factors are associated with people's skills based on the previous studies. 
In our second cluster, we have focused on the workplace learning. Uh, actually, all work-related learning, like work, learning taking place at work, through, to, through work and for work. Since previous studies have indicated also that workplace learning se seems to be associated with skills. We have also in our third cluster focused on the everyday life learning, like learning taking place in everyday and outside of work. When we focused on the adults with the vocational education and training back background, we noticed that they have a tendency to actually have lower problem-solving skills in technology-rich environments than ad ad other adults. And therefore, it was important to find what kind of factors are associated with the variation of the problem-solving skills. And we found out that regarding the social demographic factors, age, education, occupation, and gender were associated with the skill level. And then we shift our focus on the work-related learning. And we noticed that use of the ICT skills at work and learning at work. And what I think is the most interesting in this finding is actually the everyday life learning, since it seems to be very strongly associated with the skills. And we found out that the use of the numeracy skills in everyday life learning, use of the ICT skills, as well as reading skills in everyday life learning, they seem to be strong predictors for the skills. And therefore, it is very interesting for the future uh, adult training and education since we really have to focus also on the informal learning opportunities that different kind of people do have in their work as well as in their everyday life. In our study in which we focused on the vocational education adults uh, with the strong skills, we noticed very interesting findings as well, as they always seem to be younger more often male, and more often in skilled occupations. Furthermore, we found out that what people do in their work seems to be very important, as active use was more common with the strong performers than with other adults. For example, and especially in the numeracy, ICT, reading and writing. Same goes for everyday life learning, as the strong performers seem to have participated in the adult education and training, both job-related and non-job-related, more actively than the others. And as I mentioned earlier, in the second phase, we actually focused on the adults with the higher education background. We have seeked what is the level and distribution of problem-solving skills in TRE for the adults with the higher education background, as well which factors are associated with the strong and respectively weak problem-solving skills in technology-rich environments for the adults with the higher education degree. And our results actually indicated that uh, for the adults with the higher education, there is a tendency to have high problem solving skills. And we used the SVE model again, and we found out that for the social demographic factors, the age and parental education seems to be influential, as well as for the work related factors, occupation seem to play a role, as well as the industry in which people were working at. Finally, we focused also on this very interesting everyday life learning factor, and we found out that how much people use the ICT at home seems to be an important indicator, as well as adult education and training, and interestingly, non-job related. However, when we investigated the cri different group of adults, we came across the very critical finding that the problem-solving skills in TRE for the people working in the edu education seemed to be lower compared to the other fields. So of course this raised our interest and we focused on and seek to understand why this is actually so. And we found out that the educational workers seem to have fewer opportunities to actually learn at work. 
And of course, these findings are very worrisome. And therefore, at the European as well as in the worldwide level, we really need to focus how to help teachers to actually develop their own skills as well as to help students to develop their skills. And to do that, we actually, in the learning sciences, need to cover a multiple aspects, such as emotional, cognitive, social dimensions, and how these become worked upon, for example, in the teaching context. When we, but when we think of the professional development, how these, these become worked in the other co context as well. And therefore, in the second phase of this talk, we will focus on these novel methods. For example, heart rate variability, eye tracking, and face recognition, as well as how do people use their voice. Hello, welcome aboard. We are interested in technology enhanced learning. Our research aims to understand how learning and interaction occur and unfold over time in workplace learning contexts, such as in hospitals and in flight simulators. We have also made methodological development on applying the large-scale assessment data to understand problem-solving skills of adults with vocational training or education. Our research group aims on scientific breakthroughs on developing novel methods such as eye tracking, heart rate variability and automatic content analysis on the area of learning and professional development. The focus of our research is not only what learning occur occurs in technology-enhanced contexts. Instead, we aim to understand how learning and interaction processes unfold over time. This research line enables testing whether the technology-enhanced learning and instruction situations occur as we planned or what kind of refining is needed. In this talk, we present two examples from our research. The first example relates to the computer-supported collaborative learning in the context of higher education. The second example concerns pilot's workplace learning in Airbus Full Flight Simulator. Let's start with the computer-supported collaborative learning in the context of higher education physics. When addressing the questions how learning and interaction processes unfold over time, it is useful to complement the variable-based approach in which the associations between independent and dependent variables are investigated. This is where the temporal analysis comes in the states. The focus of my dissertation was on developing the temporal analysis in the context of scaffolded inquiry-based learning. As an outcome of our research, we have developed a temporal analysis procedure for CSCL. The rationale for this research was that there are no established procedures for the temporal analysis. This means that researchers may not have roadmap or knowledge on the necessary operations that should be conducted when analyzing the temporal aspects of CSCL. Our review article illustrates the various theoretical and methodological approaches that the researchers have utilized when analyzing the temporal aspects of CSCL. This is again contrary to the variable-based analysis in which statistical inference practices are very well established and there are toolkits from where to choose a suitable method for a research problem and data when the certain assumptions are fulfilled. We have defined the temporal analysis as focusing on the characteristics of events or interrelations between events over time. When conducting temporal analysis and conceptualizing these events from the process data, we usually adapt multimodal perspective on learning. This means that those events may relate to the different data modalities. In addition to the verbal contributions, such as speed turns in face-to-face -face interaction or messages in computer-mediated interaction, we can use gaze, physiological reactions and activities in digital environments that provide information on learning and interaction. 
We have specifically focused on analyzing the associations between the students' communication and the activities in the simulation-based learning environments. For example, how is the use of the simulations associated with the progress in collaborative inquiry-based learning processes? And what kind of guidance students need? And how do the different forms of guidance change the learning processes? These articles, for example, illustrate how the temporal analysis may help in designing, testing and refining the different forms of guidance. Recently, our interests have shifted to the added value of the novel data modalities, such as eye tracking and physiological measurements. We aim to understand what kind of insights those data sources could provide when we want to understand the temporal variations of the different collaborative learning constructs. Within our research group, we have been investigating the limits and possibilities of eye tracking as well. We have focused on the novice and experienced pilots and how do they look different kind of things while, while the challenging flight situations. In addition to that, we have been using eye tracking in the CSCL inquiry context. And next, Jimmy will introduce our work on that. It is known that cognitive load during computer-supported collaborative learning can be operationalized based on psychological measurement, such as heart rate and pupil diameter. This measurement also allows examining the temporal variation of cognitive load. Moreover, by using this data, we can examine if students in the same group have similar heart rate trends during the learning processes. This examination provides a lens to a psychological synchrony among learners that has proven proven to be associated with the quality of collaborative learning. We can also observe if the timing of the tops and bottoms occur at the same time, same timing among these students. It is also possible to perform similar analysis to the pupil diameter and explore similarities and differences between these two measures. This analysis may also help to identify those tasks and moments of collaborative learning processes that deserve further investigations. When studying the interaction, the crucial role of the case has no longer been recognized, for example, in the parent-infant interaction. But the role of the case in the context of CSCL has not, has not gained much attention until recently. This re recently increasing interest towards the role of case in CSCL research is probably associated with the appearance of mobile and more afford affordable eye trackers that can be used in zoologically valid settings such as authentic classrooms. The eye trackers may have a great potential when studying how learners direct and share their visual attention in a learning environment. An essential indicator of the emergency of shared learning activities and processes and tools the shared knowledge construction process could be similarity of case among the learners. In a few studies, researchers have already found positive associations between the case similarity and computer-supported collabor collaborative learning process, processes and outcomes. So far, the case similarity has usually been operationalized as a binary or aggregated variable, so that within time interval, the learners are or are not looking at the same feature of the, time, of the environment, or within portion of the time interval, the learners are looking at the same feature of the environment. To aggregate joint attention indicator might not, might not be optimal to reflect the collaborative learning processes. Thus, it would be the vital to investigate how the joint attention varies as a function of time. Together with cognitive load, the temporal variation of the joint attention and cognitive load may provide a lens to be collaborative learning processes and outcomes. In the future, the learner's analytics application could provide this information to the teacher who may adapt their guidance to collaborate learning based on the challenge of the target group. In addition to what people actually look, it's very interesting how something is said. So therefore, our investigation has been also on how do people use voice? 
while they are talking into different kind of interaction situations. And we think that this is a one very promising research line, especially when we are focusing on the learning and professional development in the future. Regarding the different aspects of learning and interaction, so far rather limited approaches have been taken to understand the meaning of prosodic features of interaction. From the, on the other hand, from the research of the acoustic speech and voice research is known that prosody actually really affects interaction and we can even think of that when we think of our own interaction situations. And therefore, we did a study in which we focused on the teacher-student interaction in the inquiry-based settings and how do teachers actually use voice in the different phases of the orchestration activities. And what we actually investigated was the rising to intonation that teachers used and feedback in signaling the support needs and elaboration with the students. Therefore, we actually think that it's not only important what you say, but even more important can be how it is said. And you can find more information of our study in the Frontline Learning Research. As we have introduced earlier, we have been focusing on the eye tracking as well as pro prosodic approaches. However, we have also collaborated with Finair regarding the pilots, which has been very interesting. And next, Joni will introduce our research in which we have focused on the heart rate variability, as well as the cognitive load and associations between those two. Now we can fly to another context, namely the pilot's workplace learning in full flight Airbus simulator. In this kind of complex learning, where the essential part of professional competence is to deal with high uncertainty in time pressure, cognitive load theory has been a beneficial framework for designing training. The cognitive load theory may help optimize simulator training by redirecting limited working memory capacities from unnecessary cognitive load to the one that facilitates learning. The research on cognitive load has relied on learners' self-reports, for example. While the self-reports have proven to provide reliable and valid metrics, they do not inform us on the temporal variation of the cognitive load. In this respect, the different data modalities, such as eye tracking, and physiological measurements can provide insights into the temporal variation of the cognitive load in simulator training. In our case, we focused on the three different approach and landing scenarios in which the task difficulty increased over time. Besides the intrin intrinsic cognitive load associated with the task difficulty and pilot's experience, it is known that the simulator environment itself may contribute to the extraneous cognitive load. Based on the various data sources, heart rate, self-reports and re retro retrospective interviews, the extraneous cognitive load from the simulator environment seemed to decrease over time, regardless of the pilot's experience. Even though it is not surprising that the extraneous cognitive load may decrease when the pilots get used to the complex learning environment, this finding again highlights the importance to focus on the temporal aspects of cognitive load and learning in general. In the future, we aim to understand what multimodal data sources capture the rapid changes in the cognitive load and how the different data sources are associated with the temporal variation of the different cognitive load sources. Currently, we are super excited regarding our forthcoming and ongoing collaboration with the Duodecim, which focuses on the VR simulations. And we also apply the heart rate variability methods within this research. And next, Emilia and Aaron will introduce our work on that. 
The fieldwork in healthcare is often unpredictable and requires a variety of skills and competencies, although healthcare professionals only have limited opportunities to experience clinical environments. VR solutions provide stable and unchanging learning environments that overcome the barriers of time and location. And also they enable creating learning scenarios that would be unsafe or impractical to create in real life. However, although one third of VR games target teaching healthcare related topics and the increasing potential of VR solutions has been recognized, the empirical evidence is still fairly limited. In this research, we explore firstly, how do VR technologies enhance professional development in VR simulation training? Secondly, what kinds of emotions are experienced in VR simulation training and how are they related to professional development? And last, how is physiological strain shown during the VR simulation training? The research is conducted in collaboration with the Finnish Medical Association Brodekim, who offer their novel VR simulation of assessment of an unconscious patient for the purposes for, of this research. In the data gathering, groups of two or three healthcare professionals conduct the simulation while their heart rate variable is measured. Afterwards, group interviews are conducted. The data consists of video and audio recordings of the simulation, HRV data, and transcribed interviews. In total, 20 professionals in two hospitals participate in the research. At the moment, we are analyzing the data and we expect the initial results at the end of 2021. And finally, we will move to the theme of the con conference, Education and Citizenship. Currently, we have an ongoing CS track project, which focuses on the citizen science. And next, we will hear what kind of things people actually do in their free time to help scientists to do their research. CS Track Project is funded by EU and it's one of the research and innovation actions. And in practice we have done it in close collaboration with our partners across the Europe. Learning and engagement in citizen science is a very interesting questions. What do we know about the practice and participation of citizen science from the practitioner's point of view? In our survey, our attempt and goal was to investigate how practitioners, how the forms of participation and the knowledge building activities take place in citizen science projects in Europe. Do we know quite well how, what kind of citizen science is actually taking place? What kind of practices uh, do we have in citizen science projects? Research have noted that the, this, these activities have not noted or documented quite well. And this is our attempt to investigate how this, these things happened in citizen science projects. Our goal was to study using the survey how the actual uh, participants' roles are structured, what kind of participation uh, types of uh, engagements takes place in citizen science activities. There are many different kinds of projects happening at, at the very uh, widely around Europe and the world. However, what kind of uh, engagement structures or engagement uh, practices do citizen science particip participants have? Next, Heli will discuss on data analysis and initial results of the study. According to our initial results of the CS track survey, 41% of those who participate in citizen science are female and 56% are men. Also, older people tend to participate in citizen science more than youngsters. According to the initial results of our survey, 53% of the respondents reported to be 51 years old or older. Also, only 4% reported to be 20 years old or younger. Talking about the level of education among, among citizen scientists, most of the participants have completed master level or equivalent level education. Nearly one in five citizen scientists have doctoral or equivalent level education. 
the most common research area of the education is biology, ecology and geography. Participating in citizen science offers many situations and possibilities to experience the increase of knowledge. According to the initial research, results of our survey, citizen scientists have experienced that they learned the most while interacting with others, searching information from the internet, reflecting their own knowledge and actions and while collaborating with others. The respondents reported that they have used skills such as critical thinking, collaboration, communication and reading information literacy. According to our respondents of the Citizen Science Survey, every Citizen Science project has its own best and worst practices. But let's focus on the best ones. As the best practices of the Citizen Science projects the respondents named such things as collaboration, equality, discussions, contacts, communication and getting together. Also, good instructions and coordination received praise. Coming back to learning, one main theme of best practices is increase in knowledge and learning itself. Luckily, we are not alone in this project to work with the teams of learning and citizen science through the multi-methodological triangulation with our CS track partners we aim to clarify clarify our vision of citizen science we combine for example databases network analysis and survey analysis to observe different participant roles in citizen science forms of participation and in the end to investigate what citizen science actually is. Next, conclusions. Citizen science is sticky. People tend to engage in it for years and regularly. According to the initial results of the survey, 42% of respondents have engaged in citizen science over 10 years and 35% engages in it every single week. So, what drives a person to participate in citizen science? Most common research reasons to participate in citizen science are interest in theme and topic, contributing to a scientific research and guess what? Opportunities to learn. Very special thanks for your interest within this talk. And now we come to the conclusions. As we have introduced, there has been three parts within this presentation. Firstly, we focused on our investigations regarding the large-scale assessment studies. And to be a bit more specific, it seems that since the technologies are exchanging our whole society, it really kind of like create new kind of challenges for the whole society as well as for the education. And therefore, it's extremely important to actually also investigate these changes through the large scale assessment studies and understand what is the state of art within this kind of like um, the skills and competencies that pe people do have. And therefore, we firstly focused on the adults with the vocational education and training. And we came across to the very critical finding that they do have, or they seem to have lower skills than the other adults. And of course, this sets a lot of challenges for the future education, not only in the vocational education and training, but also in the continued education as well as workplace learning and therefore it's very important that we seek different methods to actually develop better ways to enhance the skills and competencies for the adults with the vocational education and training background and after we had focused on the vocational education and training we moved to the people with the higher education background and we noticed that people with the higher education background they actually have higher skills than other adults on the other hand we also found critical findings regarding the higher education background 
namely the teaching professionals, since it seems that teaching professionals have lower skills than other adults with the higher education background. And of course, this is like from the one hand kind of understandable, because if you kind of compare engineers and teachers, it's easy to say that, OK, teachers don't need those skills as much as the engineers. On the other hand, when we think of the whole society, it's not that simple at all, because teachers have very crucial role regarding what kind of skills and competencies students actually have in the future and how they are able to use the technologies in their own teaching and through their example to actually guide and help future citizens to actually have equal skills. And we think that one of the key elements why it would be very important in the future to focus on the teaching professional skills is that if we don't focus on the teacher skills, there is a real danger that the student skills may start to be distributed and classified based on the parents and home backgrounds. And one of the final findings, what we have found through our large scale assessment studies, it's the formal, non-formal and informal learning. And especially the informal learning seems to be a very interesting issue. Since we noticed that informal learning is very strongly associated with people's skills. In the second phase of my talk, I have focused on the model novel methods that we have been developing together with our collaborators. And we have been very lucky to find very excellent collaborators. As we have been collaborating with the local hospital for a long time, and in addition to that, we have extended this collaboration to the national level organization Duadekim, which focuses on the healthcare professionals, skills and competencies. And we are also very excited about our collaboration with Finder. And within this talk, we started out uh, with the fact that very often the learning activities and processes have been kind of investigated in the one-time event. For example, pre- and post-testing, the different kind of learning outcomes. Or then when the kind of like, for example, collaborator processes have been investigated, they have been, the unit of the analysis have often been, for example, the quality of the talk. And recently, the interest has actually shifted towards the better understanding of the temporal variations. And in this, from this perspective, Yoni introduced our work in which we have been developing novel methods and novel understanding how important it is actually to understand the temporal variations that take place within the different kind of CSCL processes as well as different kind of like professional development processes. And we have been doing these investigations of the temporal uh, variations within different kind of methods. And as Yimi introduced, we have used the eye tracking methods and it's still kind of like the developmental phase that we are in. We are trying out and then we are kind of succeeding. But on the other hand, many hours of work are done and we don't really know how beneficial these new, new kind of methods will be. And the other aspect that we have focused is the prosodic of aspect and I think that that's something that should really kind of like get more attention because all of us we have been in the different kind of interaction uh, interaction kind of like situations for example in our our professional uh, life or also in the learning situation and we are very aware of how we use the voice it's actually very influential. And I think that that's something that has been a bit like overlooked within the, within the current research. And therefore more attention should be, be paid. And we already know that, for example, the, the different kind of companies are doing that work. So I think that uh, it would be extremely important that our society as an early would also contribute on that development. And 
After our introduction to the prosodic approaches, we move to the case of Finnair, in which we have focused on the pilots, those with the long experience and those who are very novice. And, and those two kind of groups of pilots were flying the same situation. And then we, it was very interesting to actually like seek what are the differences within the novice and experienced pilots. And we were actually able to find some differences and currently we are discussing with Finnair how do they actually apply that in their the pilot training. And since we know that this professional development, it's not only about the pilots, but it's actually about the, all the different kind of professional fields. We think that uh, theoretical knowledge and theoretical basis and empirical results should be really utilized to develop better understanding. And Emilia and Aaron are currently working in the case of the healthcare professionals as they introduce. And they are using the heart rate variability methods, method to actually investigate uh, how the different kind of like backgrounds, how the people with the different kind of backgrounds in healthcare actually react in the same situation. Because like in healthcare, it's very interesting because there are vocationally trained adults, then there are doctors with very high education and they all need to work as team in different kind of like group working situation. And of course, better understanding is needed, like how to enable novel professional development within the all kind of fields. And finally, we are coming to the end of this talk. And Heli and Ohto concluded with our, our results with the CS Tract project, which is very kind of like fascinating in a sense that uh, citizen science is that something that we really need to focus on the future. Because as Heli indicated, the main motivation or one of the main motivations for people to participate in the citizen science is actually learning. And from the current development of the society, we are very aware and know well that people actually need to learn novel skills and competencies. And this cannot be done through the formal education only. And therefore different kind of informal and non-formal learning activities are coming more and more important. And what this actually requires from us is the development of the methods. Not only the development of the research methods, but actually it's very crucial that we are able to find uh, more automatic ways of analyzing and also helping out students and different kind of professionals to learn within their work. For example, with the different methods of the automatic content analysis, uh, we could make a new kind of bonding through the artificial in the intelligence that people are able to use the different kind of machines, for example, and then they are, those machines are able to read how people actually act. And then human-human uh, -human collaboration is coming very important, but also human-machine collaboration within the learning and professional development. And now it's been almost 45 minutes. So very special thanks for watching. And of course, I have not been doing this work all alone. So I would like to say very special thanks for all the collaborators and co-authors of these papers that we have been discussing. And in addition to that, I wish to wish you all health and peace. Welcome to this Q&A session following uh, the keynote by Raya Hemelainen from the University of Uvascular with the title Innovative Methods and Technologies for Enhancing Learning and Professional Development. My name is Angelica Kohlberg and I'm a part of the local organizing committee in Gothenburg and I will be the chair of this session. So I welcome you all to write your uh, questions in the chat. Uh, so please start doing that and also uh, thank you Raya and colleagues for your very interesting keynote.
Uh, we look forward to discussing it here uh, with you. So we are waiting for questions to be posted in the chat. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Whether it was in a way that you are following the chat and then you are reading the question for me, or should I follow the chat and then try to pick the questions, or which is the best order to do that? Uh, okay, I, I'm I'm thinking that they might come in, a, in in some kind of order that we take them, but uh, of course, if there are many questions, then it. Um, okay, I think we just start with the first question here by Maria Luisa Schmidt. Uh, uh, why do you think teachers have lower problem solving skills than other people uh, with a high educational degree? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And we were kind of like asking exactly the same. And then therefore we did like further analysis for the, for the data that we found out. And one of the key issues that we found out was actually that the teachers seem to have less opportunities to actually learn at work. Uh, different kind of skills regarding the technology. So basically, like if we take it the fits directly, it seems that in many other professions, there are a lot more kind of affordances and possibility for professionals. To, and in the schools, there seems to be like fewer opportunities to do things like that. And I think that uh, when we are thinking of teachers' professional development, uh, the focus should be also, of course, like on the continuing education and so on, but also in the in formal learning opportunities that our schools actually do offer for teachers as a professionals. And that's something that seems to be a bit like underlooked so far, at least according to our analysis based on the on the PIAC data. It seems that teachers don't have as much possibility that, than the other professionals because we didn't have have so we didn't find so much differences regarding for example informal learning which seems to be very important indicator otherwise but teachers didn't differ differ regarding the informal learning and we have another question by natalie john here uh, there was a very brief mention of heart rate and joint heart rate between two people in the same task. Could you elaborate on this? Yes, uh, it was rather short since it's like um, still ongoing research that we are currently doing since it's, um, it's an interesting story since more than 10 years ago we did our first attempt uh, regarding the heart rate variability and like uh, within the different kind of groups and we focused on the CSCL situations and we noticed that we can kind of like find some kind of trends but then it was many years that we didn't actually do that research <laughs> anymore and now we have been kind of like coming back to that and so far we are in the point that it seems that we are able to find the trends like between two people and kind of like identify the uh, kind of like interesting points from the CSCL situation but we think that definitely other kind of methods are also needed, for example, like um, uh, kind of like uh, interaction analysis, etc., to actually like seek further because like so far it seems that like in be done based on the heart rate variability, but it's some really hard to say actually like the direct associations or correlations correlations between the different kind of things and the heart rate variability. So uh, at least with the current methods, it seems that those need to be investigated with the other methods as well. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking, uh, Natalie, John, is there something you want to add in relation to your question? You are free to do that also, if you want to say something more. Um. No, that's actually it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe I will write you an email about it for further question, I think. <laughs> okay, then we take the that's next. Very good. <laughs> okay, and uh, then we take the next uh, very inspiring presentation. It was nice to see the team work uh, within your group. 
how did you combine heart rate variability measures with self-report measure? So this is, this is yeah, this is a, a, exactly what we are currently doing. That we are kind of combining the self-reported data with the heart rate variability. So basically, we had a had a sort step in the beginning and in the end, and then we kind of like ask self-reflections from from the people but in addition to that we use the heart rate variability and we are currently analyzing if we can find the association between those two but i think that uh, at least now it seems that also the kind of talk and interaction needs to be analyzed as well because our data is not so big <laughs> so it's really hard to kind of like uh, make a big kind of like uh, results without the bigger data. On the other hand, it's kind of like, um, for example, when we are working with the pilots, it's really, really time concerning. So we cannot collect, collect like hundreds of pilots <laughs> flying on the simulators because it's like extremely, um, what I say, expensive in a sense, because the kind of simulations are really kind of um, tightly used so kind of like many hours in which we can collect the, the pilots so and also uh, i think it's time for uh, we have some time if francesca wants to to say something more or uh, comment on your response No, it's fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I have a question, um, maybe relating to the first question you got. Um, uh, I'm wondering, how, how do you characterize high problem solving skills? Uh, for example, uh, for educational workers? Well, actually, we use the PIAC data. I don't know whether you are so familiar with the PIAC data, but it's actually very interesting because it's the OECD data. And it's like, um, it's collected uh, and it's actually the new round is going and it's being tested. So it's like the only so far large scale assessment study which has tested the adult skills and based on the test results, that people actually have conducted the <laughs> problem solving skills. So that's how we use and it's classified it for the weak and moderate and then strong skills as well as the people at risk. And it's adaptive in a way that like, um, like uh, more advanced, you are more advanced task you actually get while you do. And in addition to the practical task uh, or the test, there is also a lot uh, like um, Back, background questionnaire which kind of like enables us to actually seek like that how for example educational background is associated with those tested skills uh, so i interpret your answer as it has to do with the task uh, that they are provided or yes yeah okay, okay. yeah it's a bit a um, bit similar like a visa study for the for the young youngsters so it's the OECD last and the data is available for everybody. The, the only or one of the disadvantages is that it's kind of like um, it re requires quite a lot of like background work to be able to use that data because it's not um, not that simple to understand how the how the how the data is kind of like built and how how it's um, constructed and what kind of like things can be clustered together for example and those kind of things need to be in investigated and this is actually like strongly related to the collaboration with the others since like emeritus professor Antero Malin was previously working as a main professor in the PIAC study and he kind of like came to me and started to talking that and we have that we have this very interesting data but it's like a bit under and that's how we started out uh, our research research on the on the PIAC and currently Karen is continuing under us work so it's collaboration with, uh, with them. Okay thank you for that. So we have a question from Lim. Lim. I'm curious as to what 
what inspired you and your team to go ahead with the pro prosic prosodic features of speech? Yeah, the prosodic, that, uh, that's something I'm actually super, super excited about. It was like um, five years back, I was working as a professor in the Tampere. And uh, back then, there was a professor in the field of speech and acoustics at the same university. And I started talking with her and, uh, and we kind of like started to think that, okay, mostly they had been kind of like focusing on the how do singers use their voice and uh, those kind of issues and how to kind of like protect people's voice. And then we started to discuss that actually when we think of the interaction situation, we can uh, interpret quite a lot from, from, <laughs> from how people use voice. And that's how we started out that we collected the data into authentic classroom situation. And then we kind of like did a lot of like, um, investigations together with um, Professor Anne Maria Laukanen and uh, started to think that okay this is something that we really have to focus and it's also kind of like uh, it makes sense a bit in a, in a way that when we think of like teacher student interaction the, exactly the same thing can be said in different ways and it can have like a completely different meaning and if you only kind of like um, interpret interaction processes based on the meaning of the words, then we don't really understand like the, um, how, how something is said. For example, if you say something like, look at that, you can be very excited or you can kind of like be very mad if someone has done it like completely wrong way or so. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, so there is still a, a room for one or two a short questions uh, before our time is up. So please uh, take the chance uh, asking uh, Raya some your questions. Or you can speak up also if you want to just ask something. And of course, if there are no questions, you can always like email us, <laughs> of course, for me, but also for the other members from our group, and we will be around also in the early over here, but like, uh, hopefully within two years, we will be able to see face to face <laughs> in the next early conference. So please feel free to contact and as well, hopefully the next year, the six conferences will, will they take place, it would be so urgently and needed to see people and meet meet people face to face of course this is nice but on the other hand i guess we all are kind of meeting for the face to face days as well that's true so then uh, our time is up and this uh, q r uh, is closing so i want to thank all of you you for participating and the play and enjoy the rest of the conference so Bye for now. Bye bye. Peace and help for all of you. Bye bye. Bye.